Thanks so much for joining us online for this message from Kings Harbor Church. Uh, we say this often, but it's important. We hope that you see this as a resource and not a replacement for being part of the people of God. This is meant to be a supplement, to be an encouragement, to be a challenge, in addition to how you're walking with a local church near you. And so if you are in the Southern California area and you're looking for somewhere to connect, we would love to get to know you. And in fact, at the end of this message, we'll have some next steps that we would love for you to take. And then if you're somebody that's a, in a, on a broader net farther away from us, if you're needing help to connect, we'd love to help in any ways that we can with any relationships that we have. If you would just email us at info at kingsharbor.org, we would love to see who we know that might be near you. With that in mind, we're praying that the Lord uses uh, this next several minutes in his word to shape your heart, to strengthen your relationship with him, and to turn your eyes to those that are around you that you might tell them of his goodness. And so settle in and let's hear what God wants to speak through his word. Well, good morning, Kings Harbor Church. I'm thankful to be with you this morning. Um, my name's Brian. I'm uh, one of the pastors here at Kings Harbor Church. And so I get the privilege and the opportunity to preach. And I'm excited about it. And this morning, <clears throat> we're going to find ourselves in Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. But before we go there... As I was uh, preparing and I was thinking last night, I was actually getting ready to get into bed and the Lord just kind of flashed me on this time when I was a child. I used to sit in my room and above my closet, there was this, this plaque and on this plaque it said, prayer changes things. And I used to think to myself like, Lord, the power that's in prayer can change things. And I can't think of a, a better time than this season that we're in that we need to be in prayer, asking the Lord to move and to change a few things. And I don't mean just our circumstances, but I mean maybe our hearts, maybe our minds, maybe the way that we're thinking and the way that we're moving in this season. And so before we get into his word this morning, I want to invite you to join us in prayer. I want to invite you that, that today you can come by the church from two to three and the elders are going to be here to pray for you. I want to invite you this Wednesday, that midweek at 7.30 p.m., we're going to be on Zoom and we're going to be praying. And we're going to ask the Lord to change some things. We're going to ask him to change some things in our hearts. We're going to ask him to change some things in our community. We're going to ask him to change some things in this world. And we're going to believe that he has the power and the strength to do that. If you'd like to join us this Wednesday, you can. You can register online. Just go to the website and you'll see there. And you can sign up and we'll send you a link for it. Well, as we get into the word this morning, we're going to be in Isaiah. And before I jump into Isaiah, I, want to, I don't want to just drop us in 40. I want to just give us a little bit of a background. I want to set the scene for us a little bit. And so what we see is we see Isaiah is one of, one of the prophets, and he's speaking to Judah, a nation who had turned a deaf ear to our Lord. You see, instead of serving God with humility and loving their neighbor, the nation of Judah offered meaningless sacrifices to in God's temples and committed injustices throughout the nation. You see, the people of Judah, they had turned their backs on God. They alienated themselves from which he, he they alienated themselves from him, which created a need for Isaiah's pronouncement of judgment upon the nation. A judgment that changed all of Judah's circumstances. And this judgment was so that the people of God would return to him. You see, the, the, Isaiah is comprised of, it's comprised of 66 chapters. See, the first 39 of them are judgment because of disobedience, and then the last 27 are God's grace and deliverance. And so today we're going to find ourselves in 40, and we see leading up to 40 in chapter 39, we see that King Hezekiah at the time had been struck with sickness. And it was a sickness that was ultimately going to lead to death. But God delivered him from that. And God said, you know what? No, I'm, I'm going to extend your life. I'm going to extend it 15 more years. And then when we get to the next chapter, we see in 39, the king of Babylon sent, sent presents and sent gifts to him. And said, I want to come visit the kingdom. And so Hezekiah, the king, he said, yeah, come on in, check it out. And he, he opened up everything in the kingdom to the king of Babylon. Everything. 
showed them all of their fortune, all of the money, everything that they had, all the security, everything that they had, he made available and showed them. And then we get towards the end of 39, and Isaiah comes and he speaks judgment. He says, he says that the king, the one that was just here, is going to come and he's going to conquer and he's going to rule and you're going into slavery. You see their circumstances changed radically. Not just for some of them, but for all of them. And so this morning, my hope for us is that we would see in the midst of troubling circumstances, God is the source of our power and our strength. The breakdown for our text is going to be this. In verses 20 through 26, we're going to see that God has dominion over all. We're going to see in verses 27 through 31 that our confidence should be in his power. And so I'm going to start us off in verse 20, but before I do, I just want to pray for us. So would you bow your heads with me? Father God, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I'm excited about your word. I'm excited about what you're doing in the midst of of our circumstances. Lord, as troubling as they may seem and as hard as they may seem, Lord, I trust in your power and your strength, Lord. And so I'm trusting in your word this morning that you're gonna transform us as a people, that you're gonna transform our minds, you're gonna transform our hearts, Father God, that we're gonna leave this place, that we're gonna stand up from maybe sitting around the TV this morning and watching a sermon, and we're we're gonna be filled with your power. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would do that. Lord, I pray against the distractions right now. Father God, I pray against all that we've brought into us into this moment, Lord, that you would just remove it and you'd help us to focus and see what you have for us, Father God. And so, Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would use it in a mighty and powerful way this morning. It's in your name. Amen and amen. All right, church, if you would, we're gonna start in verse 20. Point number one is gonna be God has dominion over all. And he says this. He says, do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like the curtains and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Verse 23, who brings princes to nothing and makes rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely they are planted scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in all the earth, then he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on the high and see who created these. He who brings out the host by number calling them by name, by greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. He is the one who sits above the circle of the earth. Let me just, let's just stop, and I don't want to move past the fact that we are talking about the creator of heaven and earth. We are talking about the one who sits above it all. The one who created the sky, the sea, the land, the vegetation, the sun, the moon, the sea creatures, the fish, the birds, the animals, all of mankind. The creator of you and me. And not only did he create earth, he has dominion and authority over it. This is what 1 Chronicles 29, 11 says, says, yours, O Lord, is greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty in need everything, indeed everything that is in heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion. O Lord, you exalt yourself as head over all. He has dominion and authority over all his creation. And if that is true, then he has power over all his creation. You see, look at verses 23 and 24. He says what? Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. See, this word temptus, it's, it's actually, it means a storm. It's a, it's a wind. It's something that just comes through and blows them away like they're nothing. 
You see, he's saying, I am the one who bring princes and rulers to nothing. He's saying, I am the one who blows on them and they wither away. He's saying, I am the one who is in control. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he is in control now? Do you believe in the pen bass this past year in the midst of your circumstances, he's in control? Colossians 1.6 says, For him, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Do we believe that, church? You see, this past year, it has not surprised God. Your sin does not surprise God. The condition of our country does not surprise God. The person sitting in the White House this morning does not surprise God. He is the one who created heavens and earth. He is the one who has dominion and authority over it. He's the one who brings up rulers and blows on them, and they disappear. He's in full control. He's creator. Listen, our circumstances do not confuse him. They don't make him tired. He's not worried. He does not get thrown off his game when there's a pandemic, when there's fires or floods, when people riot and storm the Capitol. God is not and was not dismayed. God was not crushed by the election results. He is all powerful. His power has no limits. He's all knowing. He's able to be everywhere at every time. He's the beginning and the end. He is creator. Listen, friends, our circumstances may have changed, but God has not. He is and will always be in full control. And his power, his control, his authority, and his holiness are displayed in all of creation. All you have to do is look up and look out and say, the God who created me, the God who created that, he is in full control. He is master over all. And we see this in verses 25 through 26, if you would. Look at verse 25 with me. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes. On high and see, who created these? Who brings out the hosts by numbers, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Friends, there is no one like our God. He's greater than anything on earth or anything in heaven. You see, his creation displays his wisdom. It displays his power, his control, his authority, his holiness. And just because our circumstances changed, his power has not, his wisdom has not, his control has not, his authority has not. He's greater than any other nation and their God. And this is what he's saying to the people of Judah. He's saying, look, the people around you, people in the nation of Judah, they're worshiping the skies. They're worshiping creation. They're not worshiping the creator. But I'm bigger than that. I'm the one who created creation. I'm the one who has the power to bring stars and the moon and the sun and the land and the creatures. In verse 25, we see that he says, He's holy. And see, the, the Hebrew word for, for holy is kodesh, and it means an apartness, a set apart, a separation, sacredness, and otherness. You see, God is totally above his creation, above his creatures, above you and me. He's greater than us. He is greater than any religion. He is greater than any drug. He's greater than any vice. He's greater than any TV show. He's greater than any amount of money in your bank account. He's holy. He's set apart. 
And friends, he calls us to be holy. This is what 1 Peter 1.15 says. But he who is called you is holy. So you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written. You shall be holy, for I am holy. You see, friends, we are set apart because he is set apart. Our lifestyles should be distinguished from other unbelievers. And they should match our profession of faith. And so let me ask you, how do people see you in this season, in the midst of changed circumstances? Would they say, oh man, that person's walk, he's set apart. He's, he's holy. It's not easy. It's been a tough season. Circumstances aren't ideal. And then we see in verse 26, he says this. He says, lift up your eyes on high and see who created these things. Who brings out their hosts by na- number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Man, not one is missing. Psalms 19, one says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Hmm. Have you ever stopped to contemplate what type of power and creativity it must have taken to create human beings, this whole earth and everything in it? You see, uh, about three weeks ago, me and my family, we, we got to go out camping. We said, you know what, we, we just want to go see some stars. We want to go see God's creation. And so we went to Joshua Tree. And if you've not been, and I'm ashamed to admit it, at 43 years old, I've never been to Joshua Tree. And so it was our first time, and it was amazing. We got an opportunity to just see God's creation, to sit out at night, the middle of the night, and just look up at the stars like a tent that encompassed us, that just surrounded us from, from left to right. You could, you could just see the end of the horizon was just stars. And we got to see these beautiful rock formations. And it was glorious and to look up and to see what, my, my, what type of power it must have taken to put these things. And he just flung them up there and he knows their names. It's interesting, as I was reading and I was studying about creation, I came across this, this star. It's called, it's called Betelgeuse, just like the movie, yes, don't get confused. But it's 527 light years from Earth. And so let me just give you the, I'm, I'm going to read what that is. Just so you, we have the, how big and how far this is. It's 3 quadrillion, 97 trillion, 969 billion, 402 million, 76,285 miles from Earth. And it's twice the size of Earth. Think of the power and creativity it must take to make something that big that far away. Astronomers now estimate that there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And there are 125 billion galaxies in the universe. The total number of stars estimated are 20 billion trillions. And he knows every last one of them. He created every last one of them. Listen to me. If he knows, if he knows the name of every star in the sky, then how much more does he care for those he created in his own image? So here's what I want us to hear. God is greater than anything on earth. He's greater and more powerful than any circumstance or season we find ourselves in. Do you believe that? This is what God's saying to Judah. Your captivity, your circumstances, they are not beyond me. They have not surprised me. They are not bigger than me, and they are not more powerful than I. But where will you put your confidence and trust today? Will it be in idols? Will it be in your leaders? Your bank account? Your church building? Will it be in your comfort? No. Friends, in verse 27, look at verse 27 and 31. Our confidence should be in his power. He says in verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded by my God. Have you not known? 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm sorry, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Verse 30, even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Friends, hear me this morning. Your ways are not hidden from the Lord. No, he sees you. He knows you. He created you. He's not far from you. He's with you. God has not forgotten you. Just because your circumstances changed does not mean your inheritance has. Our circumstances may change, but our identity does not. His promises do not. And our future glory has not. You've been adopted by the king of kings. And he calls you his son and his daughter. His word says that those who the father gives, no one can take from me. Your circumstances don't change your identity. Your circumstances don't change who he is. Your circumstances don't change who he calls you to be. And this is what I love about Psalms 139. In verse 13, he says this, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secretly, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So I'll ask us again, where is our confidence Is it in ourselves? Is it in our political party, a president, a country? Or it is in the one who so intimately knew you, he wove you together in your mother's womb. That he formed your days before you were even born. Before you even knew what was going to happen. Before you were a flash in your mom's eye. He already knew you from the beginning and the end. And look, friends, he does not get tired. Our circumstances don't make him weary. Look at verse 28. He says, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint. or He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Once again, he's asking, this isn't, this isn't he's looking for an answer to this question. It's rhetorical. It's come on, you know this. I'm everlasting. There's no end to our God. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. My understanding is unsearchable. My Isaiah 55 later on would say this, my thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Look, friends, there are times in our lives we're not going to understand or grasp our circumstances or what God's doing. And we're going to have to trust and have faith in our identity and his power. I think of it kind of like this. uh, When we were on our trip to Joshua Tree, I had my son Levi and they have these great rocks that you can climb. And so he's climbing this rock and we're sitting over there and it's called Skull Rock and he's trying to climb up into one of the eyeballs that's there. And you see, he's... He, he's gotten halfway up this rock and he realizes, I'm stuck. You see, his circumstances went from, I can do this, I'm going to get there, to I'm stuck. But here's what I love, like, like his identity is that he's my son. And see, I, and I'm his father. And so there's a, there's a piece of with his identity, there's trust that's built into that. And so in the midst of that, he had to trust that the strength of his father who's holding him to that rock, who's got him by one foot, is going to hold him there so that he can move through his circumstances and get to the other side of it. 
And it was both his identity and the power of, of my strength, which isn't very powerful, would have hold him there and to help him up that he was able to get through it. And so I just want you to think of your circumstances this way, that wherever you're stuck at, the Father's hand is on you and he is pushing you through it so that you can break through that circumstance and hit the other side of it. I love that he says that he's the everlasting. I am everlasting, he says. There's no end to our God. He's the beginning and the end. You see, friends, I think most of the time when we say we trust God, it's because we want him to change our circumstances. Lord, I trust you, so just change this. Lord, I trust you, so bring me out of it. When I think what he wants is for us to trust that he will provide the strength and the power to endure our circumstances. Now hear me, he does change circumstances. But most, more often than not, he's using your circumstances to form and mold you. And that forming and that molding and those circumstances can be painful. And they can be hurtful and they can be hard. But what he's saying is, I am molding you and I am forming you and I will give you the strength and I will give you the power to endure it. And I will deliver you. You see, we're going to have to trust the one who created us, the one who adopted us, the one who calls you a son and a daughter is in control. And the one that is in control does not grow faint or weary by our circumstances. Your circumstances don't make him tired. They are not too big for him. In fact, if we looked at verse 29, we would see that he gives strength to the weak. Look at this in verse 29. He says, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. Here's what I know, friends. This season has been exhausting. All of our circumstances have changed. We've been in a pandemic for nine plus months. There's been death, job loss, depression, fear, fighting, political unrest, riots, fires. Friendships are falling apart. Families are falling apart. Lives are falling apart. The church is divided and the country is divided. And if this season has taught us anything, it's taught us how weak we are. But what if? What if we're not seeing our weakness and circumstances in this season right? What if I told you we serve a God who works in the midst of our weakness and circumstances? What if our circumstances aren't the problem, but they are the fuel God wants to use to accomplish his plan and purpose in our lives? What if our current circumstances were God's means to advance the kingdom through you and me? What if our current weaknesses are God's tool for the advancement of the kingdom in his glory? What if we don't see it right? What if we've been missing it? What if we said, Lord, you brought us here and you're doing it for a reason? What if he has you where you're at right now because he wants to use you for his kingdom and his glory? This was Paul, right? This is 2 Corinthians 8 through 10. What does he say there? He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more God, I will gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ might rest upon me. For the, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insult, hardship, persecution, calamity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can you say that this morning? Can you say, when I am weak, I am strong, that no matter where God has me, what circumstance I find myself in, the power of Christ rests upon me and is, an ava is, is available for me? When we are weak, he is strong. God works through weak people. His word said he usually took the foolish things to shame the wise. 
God works through circumstances. I love the story of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach because here's the deal. Daniel's circumstances were not good. He was in a den full of lions. But guess who showed up in power in the midst of that circumstance? God did. He shut the lion's mouth. And guess who got the glory at the end from the king at that time? God did. A whole decree went out to all the land. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Look, circumstances were not ideal. They were thrown into a fiery furnace. Who shows up in the midst of the fiery furnace? God does. Walking with them in a circle. They have to bring them out. The fire's so hot, the people trying to get them out of the furnace, they melt right there on the spot. But guess who gets the glory at the end of it? God does. What happens, a decree goes out into all the land. This God is mighty. This God is powerful. He is the King of kings. And this is what is happening to Judah in the book of Isaiah. He's changed their circumstances and he's brought them from a place of power to weakness. And so this begs the question, why? Why would he allow this? Because he desires their hearts. They were an adulterous people. They'd become numb and complacent and blinded by comfort. What if, like Judah, he is trying to recapture our hearts this season? What if he has changed all of our circumstances so that we would turn to him, trust him, worship him? Lay down the idols of comfort and preference and lean into his power and strength. What if he wants to use this season to recapture the hearts of his people so that he could mobilize us to advance his kingdom. Let me ask you, how's this, chi- how's this season caused your heart to wander? Does your heart prefer something other than Jesus? You see, this is the problem when our circumstances change, we look for something or someone to fix them. And more often than not, we run to someone other than Jesus. And so let me just ask it, where have you ran to during these last nine plus months? What are you clinging to right now? Because here's what I know about our God. I know that he's a jealous God. So jealous that he'll allow circumstances to change. So jealous that he'll allow sin to have its way. So jealous that he will allow hardship and pain so that he can get to your heart. You see, he was jealous for the people of Isaiah. He wanted their hearts. They were far from him and he wanted them. You see, they didn't see a need for him. Do you see a need for him? He didn't fit their preference. Does Christ fit your preference this morning? He didn't fit their agenda or their lifestyle. So God allowed their circumstances to change, which brought them to a place of weakness so that he could flex his strength, his power, his glory, and display his holiness and recapture their hearts. And so just maybe, friends, just maybe what the Lord's doing in this season is he's changing our circumstances because he loves you, because he wants your heart, because he wants his church to prevail, because he wants to advance the kingdom through a people who he called to him. You see, our weakness is why we need the gospel. Our weakness is why he sent Jesus. God didn't come to save the healthy. He came to save the sick. He came to serve the weak. You see, it's our sinful nature that makes us weak. It's our sinful condition that requires a righteous, sinless savior and deliverer. And some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you need to hear that there is a savior. There is someone that can save your soul, that can bring you from death to life, that you are weak. We are all weak without Christ. But here's what I love, friends, that that not only is God's power available for Judah, not only is his power available for you, he ultimately delivers them. He sustained them and ultimately delivered them. And God will sustain and he will deliver us from this season. But how we engage this season, how we see it, is entirely up to us. 
And so I want to close with this last verse, verse 31. He says this, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You see, waiting on him is admitting we have no other help, either in ourselves or in someone else. Waiting on him renders us helpless until he acts. Waiting on him is to declare our confidence in his ability and timing to act on our behalf. Waiting on him is not killing time. It's not hiding out and doing nothing. No, it's living a life confident in his power, confident in our identity and our calling, believing that God will provide the power and strength when we need it for any of life's circumstances, that he will deliver in his timing. You see, we are, we are people far from being crushed by our circumstances. We are not helpless or hopeless. We are people whose identity is founded and rooted in the Savior and Creator of heaven and earth. We are a people who have a purpose, a calling, and a mission. Even in the midst of devastating circumstances. We are a people with the Savior that will give us the power and strength for anything we come up against. And why? So that we can stretch our wings effortlessly, just like the eagle does, and sail off into the wind regardless of our circumstances. Friends, you don't have to be crushed by your circumstance this morning. You are not powerless. You are not rendered useless. You have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who is ample supply of power and strength for whatever you need in this season. You may be watching this morning and you may be like, I, I, don't, I don't know about this God you're talking about, but I know I need help. I know I need strength. I know I need power. Then let me introduce you to the one, to Jesus, the one who gives all power and strength to all people, the one who can take you from death to life, the one that can give you life everlasting. And yes, we are weak. And yes, you are weak. It is God who surprises, supplies the strength that you need this morning. And so friends, Let's trust him in this season. Let's become a church that says, you know what? It does not matter what happens around us. We have the power and strength from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We will not be crushed by our circumstances. We will be a church that gets on our knees and we will pray. We will be a church that will lean into our God and our King. We're going to be a church who sees circumstances as an opportunity to advance the kingdom, not to hide and withdraw. Amen? All right, well, let me pray for us this morning. I want to pray that the Spirit would fill us. I want to pray that we would change, that there would be a course shift in directional change in our hearts and our minds. Like, what do we do with this? We need to apply it. We need to walk out of here, and we need to claim and proclaim that God is in full control this morning. And so I, I just want to pray that he would do that in you and in me. And then after that, we'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down for some communion. But let me pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the way that you have called your people, Lord. That, Lord, even though our circumstances change, Father God, we have you. We have the one who supplies the power. We have the one who gives, gives strength to the weak, Father God. We have the one who promises to deliver, Lord. And so I just pray that you would, you would shift our hearts and our minds in the midst of these circumstances. That we would not come from a place and see ourselves in a disadvantage, Father God, but we'd actually see this as a position of advantage. 
That, Lord, you are up to something and that you are working, Father God. That there is much more to what's happening right now outside these walls and these doors than we even know, can see, or even fathom. That your ways are unsearchable, Father God. And so I just pray that you would empower us, that you would shift our minds, you would shift our hearts, Father God, to see what you are doing so that we may take advantage of the opportunity that lays at our feet. And so, Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are watching this morning. Lord, I pray that your, your hands would fall upon their household, that they would feel the richness and the blessing of a king who created them, Father God, who knows them intimately, Father, that has a plan and a purpose for them, Lord. And Father, I just pray that they, they would find the strength and the power, Lord, to push through the circumstances that they find themselves in this morning and cling to the one who can save. So fill us with your spirit afresh, Father God. Fill us full, Father. Fill us overflowing so that our neighborhoods might receive from us, Father God. I pray that you would use us powerfully. It's in your name I pray. Amen and amen. Thanks so much for joining us online. We believe that a worship gathering, hearing God's word is an intentional ongoing starting point. But we also desire for you to take your next steps. And so before you end this, I would love to give you a couple of ways that you could do that. So one, below this video, there's information where you can connect with us. We wanna know that you're here and more than knowing that you're here, we believe it's vital that you're connected to another group of believers that you can do life alongside. Now, obviously there's some limitations if you're on the other side of the world with our ability to connect you. So I'm most directly talking to those who are near us in the Southern California area but we think that it's vital for you to walk with others, to live out the things that you're hearing in messages like this. Uh, second, we, we believe that it's, there's a call for all of us to serve, that the Lord has uniquely wired us with gifts, that we could take what we have and use that to serve the, the, those that are less mature. And so again, if you are near to us, we'd love for you to raise your hand and say, hey, I, the Lord's wiring me this way. How do I get involved? How do I help? How do I serve? And then lastly, we believe a, a clear sign of your discipleship is the way that you trust Jesus in every area of your life. And that includes giving. And so your ability to say to the Lord that this portion of my finances that I'm gonna be generous with for your purposes in the world because I trust you and I wanna see your name made famous is a sign that you're growing in trust as a disciple. And we'd invite you to do that as well as part of your next steps. And so we're encouraged. We can't wait to hear from you. And more than that, we can't wait to hear what the Lord's doing in your life through his word and through being part of God's people. We'll see you soon.